Welcome to the Community of Practice for Teaching and Learning podcast series. I'm Dr. Victoria Chen, and join me as we dive into stories from our teaching and learning community. So welcome to our fourth episode. This episode is on our theme of adaptability and flexibility. And to showcase this theme, I want to talk about a scenario where something outdated transitioned into a current trend that used innovative technology. The first idea that came to my mind were these podcast studios that we have been recording in for this series. I thought it would be a great opportunity to invite one of the people behind creating these podcast studios to tell us about how they came to be. So let's welcome Michael Samartis, our media specialist, into the studio today. Welcome, Michael. Hi there. So I like to start off every podcast by getting to know our guests. So how did you end up here at Guelph Humber? Well, I started working in the photo industry uh, about 15, 18 years ago, something like that. And right before I got to Guelph Humber University, I was a director at an equipment rental company. And from there, I ended up coming into the school uh, right before COVID, literally like two months before COVID. Um, so that's kind of was my path to get here. And it's been a wild time since I've been here, but it's, uh, but it's been interesting and a lot of fun. So from this role, how did the idea of the podcast studio start? When I started here, we had a large format print room within the space, and there was two printers, lots of computers. And as technology changes and as things kind of adapt and as our technology adapts, we didn't need as big of a space to support that. Uh, So while we do still have a large format printer on the fourth floor, we decided this space would be kind of more adequately used as a podcast studio. So um, we designed it so we could have multiple spaces where students come in and kind of uh, record and use the space as they needed to for their assignments. So why a podcast studio? So funny enough, the idea first came because I came to check on the printer one day and there were students recording a podcast in the space. So we were kind of short on something uh, something like that. We do have a voiceover booth, which is uh, located in uh, GH311, which is a broadcast studio, uh, but didn't really kind of give you the feeling of a podcast. The podcast is a very kind of um, involved space where people can face each other, they communicate, they can patch people in through a screen, uh, have kind of virtual communication. And the other space we had didn't really um, relate to that. So we realized that we needed to have a place that did this. And also there was some curriculum things that we want to kind of change that would lead students into the space to use the technology a little bit. So what would you say to someone who says they could just have a podcast studio at home? Like they just need a mic, Mm -hmm. a laptop, and that's it. So why have like a studio dedicated? Like the space could be valuable for other things. So kind of like what's the reasoning behind it? Well, I've, first and foremost, I mean, anything that we do in any sort of kind of art form or media form, uh, if it doesn't sound good, if it doesn't look good, mm-hmm. if it isn't colored properly, it's very, very obvious, especially because we're only relying on kind of fewer senses for each all, all of these things. So, for example, in a podcast, uh, we need to have, make sure that the sound is very, very crisp, mm-hmm. very, very deep, mm-hmm. uh, because if it's not, it kind of gets annoying to listen to. If there was kind of loud screeches and you could hear noise in the background and, you know, toilets flushing down, down the hallway, yeah. uh, that would be very, very distracting. So uh, to have a place that is sound isolated is kind of an important thing. Uh, The other thing that's kind of important about podcast studios is uh, the environment. And when you're communicating with people, you want to be in a place that you feel comfortable in and you look somewhere where you can, I mean, not necessarily be vulnerable, but be open to having open conversations about things where you're not, you know, watching people walk down the hallway as Mm -hmm. you're trying to record something. So having a personal space that you can kind of consider safe and consider, uh, you know, secluded so that when you're having your conversations, you have a very controlled environment. And that's a great point because... I was thinking like during the pandemic, how many podcasts I listened to and everyone at the time couldn't go to the studios anymore. They were at home. Everyone was really happy being at home in their closets Mm -hmm. with their yoga mats over their heads. Mm -hmm. But like you said, like it's the sound quality. Like I listen to those episodes versus when they're back in the studio, when they're face to face, like how we are. It's completely different. Mm -hmm. Like the dynamic between us versus like if we were on Zoom for two hours recording um just the conversation is different and Mm -hmm. like you said like the voice is like much crisper yeah you raise a really good point i mean we've all been through the virtual meeting Mm -hmm. and the virtual this and the virtual that and the um the fluidity of the conversation someone being muted somebody's video getting choppy that always is really kind of a challenging thing to really engage with someone especially when you're speaking about something that may be very uh someone's very passionate about like having them double back and have them repeat what they said is kind of 
uh, kind of puts a stop on the, on the conversation. So being able to be in a space together is kind of a, a big part of it. And also um, the other part of it is, uh, well, the sound is really important. The technology kind of plays a part in it as well. Um, you know, we all have, we know what a cell phone sounds like when you're on a cell phone call. Mm-hmm. It's kind of very flat. It's very tinny. So when mm. you have the ability to have kind of a robust microphone in front of you, like I was mentioning before, it gives it a little bit of depth. It gives mm-hmm. it a little more interest in the in actual sound quality of it. So that's kind of another thing that benefits it. That's a great point. So what were some key considerations you had when creating these studios? Uh, space-wise, equipment usage, accessibility, because I imagine this space was not ready for a podcast studio. Like, no, not a at all, lot of things yeah. had to change. <laughs> yeah, so there, I mean, there was a lot of challenges uh, as, you know, we had... Again, this was kind of going into the COVID time, so there was mm-hmm. a lot of supply chain issues and that kind of stuff. So getting our hands on a lot of equipment was was mm-hmm. difficult. Uh, so time wise, kind of it kind of stretched on a little bit. But some of the main things that we uh, wrapped our head around is when we first started thinking about it, we, we thought, well, why don't we do kind of a modular space where we can have like these little kind of sound isolated pods? Mm-hmm. But when we thought about it more in depth, we thought, well, you know, we have these sound isolated pods, but they're not really giving us a full in depth. Um, idea of mm. what we want to like do. That would be like one person. That would be like, like one person yeah. or two people, and it really wouldn't have like a a clean aesthetic to it. It would look kind of thrown together. Mm. Whereas when the space that the space that we're in right now, uh, you know, the sound paneling on the walls, the doors, the the way that it feels, it feels very put together. And mm. included in that is kind of the construction aspect that we put into it as well. Uh, so in these spaces, like I just mentioned about the sound panels on the walls, but the sound panels are acoustic in the ceiling. There's mm. specific, very big, broad, soft lighting in here. So if you were mm. to record a, a live stream you have nice crisp light um the other thing is we have the hvac controlled so all the hvac pipes are wrapped so you don't hear the sound coming mm-hmm. through also on top of it we've used three quarter inch drywall in all the spaces which normally in a building like this they would use half inch so we're, we're, we've just added all these little steps into the construction to the development of the space that uh really kind of elevate the things that you can do inside of it that's really cool and uh for accessibility i know are one at least one of the rooms is like wheelchair accessible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. One of the challenges is that we had a big open room and we didn't realize aorta compliances that were necessary and how very specific they were down to like kind of a quarter inch or a half inch at some points. So the the good thing is that um, we can have uh, one of our suites is, is wheelchair accessible. So somebody can come in from the hallway. There's two doorways to get in. Both are uh, automatic mm-hmm. and there is a turn radius that's uh, acceptable for a wheelchair. And on top of that, in one of our podcast suites, we have an adjustable table. So the table can be raised or lowered depending on whatever the person's needs are. When we first built the space, this actually came into play right away as we had somebody who was visually impaired come into the space. Mm -hmm. And they were actually very appreciative of the height adjustable table because Mm -hmm. where they put their hands was just a level of comfort for them. And like going back to kind of our original idea of this whole space is that comfort is a big thing. And when they were able to be comfortable in the space, they were able to speak very freely and speak very openly. And that helped the podcast that they were building kind of sound better and be better. So that was our goal with all that kind of development. That's really cool. That's something I never thought about, like a height adjustable table and how that would help like more than one person mm-hmm. and just help you feel like uh, this space really matters. Like It's like the thought was there that uh, we really wanted to make people feel comfortable and that it's inclusive. So what do you think the appeal of podcasts are? We kind of touched upon this before, but I'm someone who has to have a PowerPoint, a slide deck. I know a lot of faculty are like that too. And, you know, If you were in a classroom and you were just lecturing, we would be told you need to have a PowerPoint. But in the podcast, you're taking that away now. You're going back to just the voice. And I know during the pandemic, we were really overexposed to videos. Uh, Michael and I are on the same department. So we had like over two hour Teams meetings like every other day. And I'm sure a lot of you did too in your various departments. But podcasts really became like this way that we could still get information, but without having to look at a screen. So what are your thoughts on like why podcasts are appealing? Um, I, I So podcasts are appealing because, I mean, we all have a an innate need to kind of have audio in the background, whether it's mm-hmm. music, whether it's a radio while you're driving your car. That kind of feel of just having something in the background is really, really nice. And it's a very comforting feel. Um, but more like from an educational perspective, one thing that I've realized is the, the the semesters that we have here are, you know, 13 weeks, 15 weeks, 16 weeks at max in different different institutions. And it's hard to deliver everything you need to deliver in that amount of time. Uh, so what a podcast can really help you with in uh, 
in it educationally is providing asynchronous learning. So that's one of the main things that I found that people are using it for is that mm -hmm. they're creating asynchronous learning so that if a student decides that they want to uh, dive into something a little bit more deeper, so I'll, I'll just put it into my world so it's easier mm -hmm. to speak of for me. But like, let's say, you know, uh, a student was really interested in learning about um, a process in photography, whether it's, you know, freezing water droplets, let's say from a technical perspective, I can talk them through it in a podcast that they can listen to in studio or listen to on their own time. Or if they conceptualize mm -hmm. something down the road, they can always rely on that podcast to come back and kind of refresh their idea mm -hmm. of how to do it. So I noticed that a lot of faculty are coming here and using it for that reason. And the other thing that I found it, it very valuable for is that Getting a guest speaker in is a very difficult thing, especially because the majority of the times we get guest speakers, guest speakers are people who are industry professionals. So asking them for their time is, first of all, it's tough to do. And when you do do it, if they do say yes, you want to maximize their time when they're here because they're kind of doing you a favor, mm -hmm. right? So one thing that I found was been very valuable is that if you are using a podcast or a podcast studio like we're in now to interview your guest speaker, you can record it. You can have a really kind of, again, clean audio, clean video and record and screen record that person. And if you teach multiple sections of a program, you can now deliver that. One, you can deliver it year over year. Two, you can deliver it section over section. So you're not inconveniencing your guest speaker and you'll be able to get more out of that guest speaker because you're only using 30 minutes or 40 minutes of yeah. their time, let's say, as opposed to saying, hey, can you come by for six hours across mm -hmm. three sections to speak to my class? Like, And then you know, down the road, if you have good engagement with that person, you can do a and a at some point where you have all the sections come together who want to speak to that person and kind of do you know further down the road mm -hmm. learning with them. But you can maximize what you have with a guest speaker by live streaming or recording them and then delivering that to your class asynchronously. That's some great ideas. Mm. Um, yeah, I think, like you said, like guest speakers can be valuable. They can be expensive too, and they're time limited. So this is a great way that we can really maximize the use of that. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes if you're a student too, like you're listening to a guest speaker in class and maybe you're not having a great day, so you missed a lot exactly, of it. This yeah. is a great way that like you can listen to on your own time have mm -hmm. control over that um so you talked a lot about how faculty can use podcasts i know some faculty have used podcasts instead of essays as another mm -hmm. uh, form of how students can communicate ideas uh, do you have any ideas of how uh, staff or students could use these podcast studios too Briefly touching on what you just mentioned, like ask, putting it in, into curriculum, I think is also very valuable just based on the fact that, you know, we're living in a little bit of a different world with kind of, you know, AI generation, chat GBT, all those things that that uh, we're all very aware of. Um, and when somebody's speaking about something, it's very hard to cover up when it's not their own words and when it's not their mm -hmm. own ideas. And when it's, you know, written, maybe you can get by with a little bit more. So switching to kind of the idea where somebody has to present something and maybe not in front of a class because, you know, there's also like anxieties about public mm -hmm. speaking and all that kind of stuff that you don't want to put somebody in a situation where they're uncomfortable, uh, but you still need to get that information from them because that's a part of the curriculum. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, using it for that aspect is, is really, really great. Mm -hmm. And so for staff to use the uh, podcast studios, I think that a really interesting way they could use it is, again, for kind of group meetings and that kind of stuff is a good mm -hmm. idea. A lot of what we do now, again, touching on what I was talking about before, is providing asynchronous material. So department, departmentally, um, there's processes and things that have to happen that um, to having to repeat them over and over again to mm -hmm. new people that may be coming into the department uh, can be a challenge because, you know, processes change and, you know, you want, but you still want to have a base level for, hey, this is how we do this. This is how mm -hmm. we do this. And writing in a point form kind of knowledge base, let's say is valuable, but at the same time, it's not really engaging. So if you were to have somebody speaking it to you or somebody, mm -hmm. again, that is a screen recording saying it to you, uh, a staff member could maybe get a little bit more from it and find it a little more engaging. So the information that they're receiving is kind of sticks to them a bit more. Mm. That'd be a really cool welcome package, like an onboarding yeah, podcast yeah, yeah, for exactly. even like if you think like some, like from our vice provost, mm -hmm. like welcoming you and then your manager, your yeah. supervisors. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, and it has like kind of those step downs of like, you know, this is what you do to this, this is what mm -hmm. you do to that. And again, those things will have to be changed from time to time. But uh, the, the beauty of that is that what you say and what you show on screen can be two different things. So something that is a process that changes frequently, somebody can be talking about the kind of broad idea of what it is, but on the screen it says contact this person at this that's extension, right? right? And uh, so there's a m multiple ways to use it and there's multiple ways to think about it. And I think the more that we engage with it and the more that we use it for things that are not just kind of radio based, 
you know, mm-hmm. murder mysteries yeah. or sports <laughs> podcasts or things like that, which are great and they're all amazing. But I think we can we, there's more to it than that. And I think that, uh, again, having these spaces and having this technology gives us the opportunity to really explore that and and play with those ideas. And that's kind of what how media and art and all this kind of stuff works is that you start with this idea of, you know, it, it was used for this, but why don't we try it for this and see mm-hmm. how it works and kind of expanding the boundaries of it. Yeah, so any final words for those who might still be hesitant or like on the fence about using the podcast studio or creating a podcast? I think that the the biggest issue that people have with a podcast studio, I think, is that it can be slightly daunting. The microphones are, you know, mm. they're right up on your face and, you know, the board has a ton of sliders and knobs and colors on it. And all this seems very, very complicated, but it's really not that complicated. You can kind of get a base level of knowledge of it within a 20 minute YouTube video. Now, obviously, using it in depth and you know, using sound compressors and all this other kind of stuff that it can do will take a little bit more, you know, more learning down the road. But to just record a simple base level thing. Uh, it takes a very, very shallow depth of knowledge to do it. So I would suggest everybody who has access to it to really kind of experiment and see what it does before you kind of get intimidated by it. And there's, again, it's all, there's no film here, right? Mm-hmm. So there's no processing fees. There's no, uh, yeah. you know, film fee. It's just, you can come in, you can record something. If you don't nail it on the first try, try it again and try it again and try it again. And by the time you do it three or four times, it's going to feel very, very organic, just like talking on a cell phone. Amazing. So where can faculty, staff and students book these podcast studios? Yeah. So on the third floor, I'm sure the majority of the people in our institution here are aware of the media cage. And at the media cage, you can rent a key for the space. It's available to all media studies and communication students and all staff and faculty in the building. Uh, So you can either reserve it in web checkout and come pick it up at your convenience. Uh, or alternatively, if you don't want to do that, you can also just walk up to the media cage and deal with one of our very friendly staff members there that will get you sorted out with the key and a time to come uh, record your podcast. Great. So thank you so much, Michael, for spending your time with us today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Be sure to fill out our survey to share your thoughts on our podcast. Until next time.